Good morning, folks. Today's lecture, we are going to have one of the few lectures in this class where we're going to talk exclusively about seismology and the things that deal with seismology. Seismology is, is pretty important. Um, if we break down the word seismology, seismo relates to things of tectonics or the earth. And of course, ology is uh, the study of. So what we're talking about today, therefore, is a little bit about faults, why earthquakes happen, the different types of faults. We're going to learn a little bit about fault notation. Uh, so sit, these are some of the very, very basic and fundamental things you're going to need to know so you can communicate with other earthquake experts. So the very first thing we need to talk about is a very basic and fundamental theory in earth mechanics that's called the elastic rebound theory. The elastic rebound theory describes why earthquakes happen in the first place. It's not a new theory. It's pretty old. It was presented in 1911 initially. And it, it talks about why energy is released um, in the first place. So I like to, um, and, and Kramer likes to liken earthquakes to a stick. So if you look on the right side here, imagine that we have this brittle stick that I'm outlining. And it initially, it started like a straight stick. So we're moving half the stick that way, we're moving half the stick this way, and uh, here where the stick attaches to these moving blocks, let's assume those are rigid connections, so they can't bend, they can't move. Uh, but so the only place where the stick is going to move or bend is right in the middle of it. So as we start to move this stick, it starts to deform like we see. And it's going to keep deforming and keep deforming and keep deforming until eventually the strain is too much it exceeds the yield strength of the stick and the stick breaks. Now, in the moment that the stick breaks, it's going to send out energy waves. And those energy waves are going to travel up the stick in both ways and they're going to propagate out. That's the same idea that happens um, with earthquakes. We have a buildup of elastic strain energy. The, the faults lock up but they're still trying to move. And so you have this ductile rock, which slowly starts to deform, slowly starts to deform, slowly starts to deform, but eventually you get a sudden fracture of the rock. And when you get that sudden fracture of the rock, all of a sudden you get a big strain and energy gets released in all directions. And it propagates outward from the break or, or where the rock um, broke and, and the slippage occurred. That, my friends, is an earthquake. And that's where earthquakes come from. So when movement occurs on a portion of a fault, stress is going to get transferred to a certain part of the fault that we call the asperities. So the asperities, um, if, if I zoom in and do a very simplified sketch here, um, if I look at, say, one side of the fault plane and I have the other opposite side of the fault plane, I may have a point where it gets locked maybe in a couple places. So these points where the rocks lock, oh, I should say maybe this is moving that way and this part of the rock is moving this way. So these places where I'm circling are places where you see the rock gets locked up. We call those asperities. So the places where the fault locks up uh, are the places where all of the stress is being built up from the locked fault. And so um, when movement occurs, the asperities break, slippage occurs, and the fault keeps moving until either all the energy is gone or more asperities lock up again. And you begin to build up more stress. And as you build up more and more stress on the um, asperities or as the asperities begin to try to balance it out, it leads to aftershocks. 
So aftershocks are always occurring after major earthquake events and even after minor earthquake events. All aftershocks are, are the redistribution of stresses and the fault trying to figure itself out. So um, the relocking up of different asperities. So a couple of things that are important to understand is that uh, if I have a fault, say I have the Wasatch fault. So um, let's go to my whiteboard. And uh, here I have the Wasatch Mountains. Uh, here's Draper coming around to Highland, Alpine. So that's north. Uh, this is south. The Great Salt Lake is uh, up here. Sorry, that's a pathetic looking lake, I know. And then I've got Utah Lake down here. Um, so this is, uh, let's see, Salt Lake, Draper, Provo's down here. Whoops. Okay, so you've all heard of the Wasatch Fault. Now there's this idea out there that the Wasatch Fault is some big scary uh, let's make the fault red because that's a scary color and we'll even make it a little thicker So there's this idea that the fault is this big thing that's going to run down through here And it's one big long fault and if it goes it's going to be the end of the world uh, That would be bad, but that's really not how Fault ruptures work Instead what we tend to see are fault rupture in what we call segments so there's, in other words, there's a segment that runs like this that we call the Salt Lake City segment. And then there's another segment which picks up right around the Salt Lake segment and it runs down here and uh, wraps all the way down around Provo, south of Provo, goes down a pace, and that's called the Provo segment. Up north of Salt Lake, you have another segment which uh, picks up on the other side of Bountiful, and so it's going to pick up here and go up north. We call that the Weber segment. Segments are defined as sections of the fault that tend to rupture at the same time. So um, hopefully that little sketch makes sense to you. So faults rarely are going to rupture all at once, but they're going to rupture according to their segments. And so we're interested in segmenting the fault and characterizing the recurrence or how often different fault segments tend to rupture. Now, don't get me wrong, it is definitely possible for multiple segments of the fault to rupture at once, and that's definitely happened in the past, um, not just at the Wasatch Fault, but other faults across the world. Uh, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about earthquake recurrence and different earthquake scenarios when we get into seismic hazard analysis, but for the time being, just, just understand that faults are comprised of segments. So if a long time passes before a segment ruptures, you know that strain is continuing to build up, or, or I'm sorry, stress is continuing to build up on the fault, but it's locked up at its disparities. Um, we know that as stress continues to build on that fault segment, eventually it's going to rupture. When, um, so when you have a zone or a, a, a segment of the fault, that is building stress, building stress, building stress, but it hasn't gone yet. But maybe the segments around it have gone. So worst case scenario, let's say that the, the Provo segment here, um, let's say it ruptured, I don't know, 500 years ago. I'm just making these numbers up. And let's say that the Weber segment ruptured 200 years ago, but the Salt Lake segment hasn't ruptured in 1,500 years. All that means is you've got strain that was relieved in the Weber uh, section of the fault, strain that was um, and stress that were relieved in the Provo section of the fault, but you still have stress that's building up in the Provo section of the fault. And if you were a betting man, you would say, well, if I were to bet on the next location of the earthquake, it would probably be on this segment of the fault where it's locked up and ready to go. We call those sections seismic gaps. Seismic gaps are a um, pretty interesting theory. And uh, for instance, this is a figure out of your Kramer textbook that shows how a seismic gap works. So uh, what we have here on the x distance is um, distance 
along the San Andreas Fault. So up here, up north, we have San Francisco, all the way down to Parkfield, California. That's kind of in central California. So it's a 200 miles south or so of, of San Francisco. And each one of these little dots here represents earthquakes that occurred over uh, a 20 year period um, before 1989, before the Loma Prieta earthquake. And so you see all these dots are events or earthquakes. They're places where the fault slipped and so stress is reduced or not building up anymore and, and instead we had strain. And you can see that we had a gap build up um, right here in the what we call the Loma Prieta gap. We know there's a gap because there's no there's not very many dots right there especially compared to this zone right here or this zone right here. Um, by the way each of these lines represents a segment of the um, of the San Andreas Fault. Okay, so you can see that strain was um, occurred in the San Juan Bautista segment of the fault, but it didn't occur in the Loma Prieta Fault, so stress was building up. But then in 1989, this set of earthquakes happened. That was a Loma Prieta earthquake. And so all of a sudden it filled in this gap, this seismic gap that was here, and it released the, the strain, and then it locked up in other places. So it's interesting, um, there was a gap down here in Parkfield. We talked about that, that gap was filled in 2004. Don't you find it interesting where the next gap is? Kind of scary when you think about it. Another uh, feature of fault rupture that we need to talk about, uh, and we're only going to talk about it briefly here, and we'll talk about it more later in the class, but I just want to introduce the idea. And it's called fault rupture and near source effects. So um, we, we often treat earthquakes like they occur at a single point. So in other words, whoops. So in other words, uh, when an earthquake happens on, and you see it on the news, so let's, let's go back and let's draw our mountain range for the Wasatch Front. Let's draw our lake again. Okay, so let's say an earthquake does occur what you're going to see on the news is like some star and then you see little circles emanating out of it right and and so then they always say that's the epicenter did you like my newscaster voice the epicenter occurred at this location yeah okay cool but let's talk about really how faults rupture so the epicenter is uh, something is the location where the earthquake uh, essentially initiated but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's where the earthquake occurred um, rather when earthquakes occur if i have a fault segment that looks like this it may initiate somewhere but it's going to initiate and it's going to propagate down the fault or up the fault or in both directions and as it propagates think of it like um, i'm going to try to draw this here I'm going to try to draw a zipper. So think of it like a zipper that's coming undone. Right? So as the zipper is, is coming undone, um, it's releasing energy and it's moving in, in, this, in this direction. As faults as the fault ruptures and it rips open in a particular direction, every time the rock rips or every time the rock breaks, it releases more energy. And that energy begins to accumulate and build up upon itself. And so this is going to generally produce ground motions that um, are larger as we move away from the fault in the fault normal direction. So what I mean by that is if this guy right here 
is my rupturing fault. As my, my rupture propagates along the fault that way, it's going to emanate waves away from it. This direction, normal to the fault, is what we call fault normal. And we say fault normal tends to be a lot more powerful than energy in the fault parallel direction. So that's fault normal. This is fault parallel. I'm going to reduce the size of my pen a little bit. Okay. So fault normal tends to be bigger than fault parallel. Now, the other thing that's interesting is as the rock continues to break over time, this happens very, very fast, but every time the rock breaks, it releases more energy. And that energy begins to compound, 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 compound in the direction of the fault rupture. It's, it's like the Doppler effect. And so as you get that constructive interference, meaning the energy is building upon itself, in the direction of the fault rupture. We call that forward directivity. So you're getting a huge mass of energy out in front of the fault rupture. The interesting thing is if you look in the opposite direction, on the back side of the fault rupture, you see that uh, it's spreading out. I'm boxing that instead of circling it. You get a spreading out effect behind the fault rupture. So that's in the backward direction. So you get less energy, but your duration is larger, meaning that the waves are coming for a longer period of time. Now, in the case of forward directivity, if you're within about 10 kilometers of that fault and that energy is coming towards you, it can be very, very damaging, particularly if you have high period structures. In other words, structures that have a high natural period or a low natural frequency. So this directivity effect is similar to the Doppler effect. And you guys are, should be familiar with the Doppler effect from your high school physics class, where if you have like a train or a police car or something that's driving towards you, the, the pitch, the sound that you hear from the train's horn or the siren on the police car changes when the car passes you and is now moving away from you instead of toward you. Um, that's the same effect of directivity. And by the way, it's this directivity effect that made mincemeat of um, the city of Kobe in the 1995 earthquake. Now, because of the elastic rebound theory that we spoke about, um, we can attempt to quantify the amount of um, quote unquote work that is performed when an earthquake occurs. This is, in other words, an indicator of how much energy was released when the fault ruptured. Uh, and so we're going to use a term that's called a seismic moment. Now, a moment, you recall, is a, um, in essence, it is a force over a distance. And this seismic moment is no different than that. What we have is we have um, a strength we have an area and we have a distance. So if I have um, a strength or a stress and I multiply that by its corresponding area, then I get a force. And if I have a force times some distance, then I have a moment. So we call this a seismic moment. Now, you got to understand, this isn't going to be like moments you've computed in your strength of materials class or your uh, statics class. These moments are enormous because we're dealing with enormous pressures and enormous areas. So we're not talking about like um, joules or, um, or you know, newton meters or those kinds of things. We're talking about... Um, orders of magnitude of, of what we're going to call ergs, okay? And so uh, when you calculate your seismic moment uh, numbers, when you use this equation, don't be surprised if you're up in like to the 10 to the 28th or 10 to the 36 or whatever. Um, that's perfectly normal for the, the type of energies that we're talking about. All right. Let's learn a little bit about geometric notation. So these are going to be the terms that we use to describe the geometries of a fault.
So let's imagine we've got someone here um, walking around in the class. It could be any one of you students. You're walking around up on the ground surface and you're having a nice day. Now, an earthquake occurs someplace beneath you in the earth. Okay, now as we learned, the earthquake doesn't really occur in one spot, but we're going to say this is where the earthquake initiates. So that point where it initiates, um, we're going to call that the focus or the hypocenter. Those, those two words essentially mean the same thing. It is the point, the exact point where the asperities broke and the earthquake began. Now the depth to those asperities from the ground surface straight down is what we call the focal depth. So you'll often hear um, seismologists or earthquake experts when they talk about a fault or an earthquake that occurred, they'll ask it occur or they'll say it occurred at some depth blah. Uh, that's what they're talking about is the focal depth. If I were to project the focus straight up to the ground surface, that point on the ground surface right above the focus is what we call the epicenter. And so the epicenter is what most people are familiar with because it's what the media uses when it reports earthquakes. Now if you take the distance from the epicenter straight over horizontally to you on the ground surface, we call that the epicentral distance. But the epicentral distance doesn't really mean anything. It's not the actual distance from the energy release to you. The actual distance from the release of energy to you is what we call the hypocentral distance. So these are the different terms, depths and distances epicenter and focus that I expect you to be familiar with. Now let's talk about geometries of the fault. So uh, let's see, let's, let's draw, here's your house. Oh, that's an awful looking house. I apologize. I'm trying. Here's you walking out on the ground surface. So this gray plane that you see here, that's the ground surface. It's a horizontal plane. And out behind your house is the fault. Okay. Now, if you got to understand, um, I'm going to redraw this, but I'm going to try to draw it in three dimensions. So you have basically two planes. Imagine almost two blocks. And, you know, we could say maybe um, this one's moving up and that one's moving down. Okay. And here's your house. On the ground surface. And this guy right here is the fault behind your house. So what we uh, tend to say is that this plane that I'm shading right here, this plane we call it the fault plane or the fault scarp. It's the, it's the evidence or the face that there's a fault actually there. Now the orientation of where the ground surface touches the fault plane or the fault scarp, we call that the strike. The strike is a direction or an azimuth. So in other words, uh, go back to my whiteboard. If I'm looking down, here's the mountain range. Here's your house. Here's the fault. So if I'm looking down, the direction that the fault is pointing, that's the strike. Here's the strike down here. Um, so that direction on an azimuth scale where, again, straight north is zero and you go all the way around to 360. So, you know, straight down, that's 180. You guys have seen this before, 90, 270. The direction that the fault is pointing on the azimuth scale, that's the strike. 
Okay, the dip is the actual angle that the fault plane makes with the horizontal ground surface. That's the dip angle of the fault. Well, no, that's the dip, I'm sorry. The dip angle is the angle that that makes. So um, if I say in the dip direction, the dip direction is straight down the fault plane. The strike direction is straight along the strike of the fault. Okay. Hope I should read, uh, erase all this so you guys can see what I wrote here. So strike slip, it means that the fault is moving in the direction of the strike. So in other words, going back to my little, um, ah, I erased it. Let's redraw it. There's your house. I'm trying to be um, very thorough in teaching you guys this because sometimes a lot of confusion can arise with regards to these terms and I want to be very, very clear. Okay. If this block moves down the dip angle relative to that and so we're moving along the dip face, we're going to call that a dip slip. Okay, if the fault moves in the direction of the strike relative to one another, so not down the dip face, but along the strike, then we're going to call that a strike slip. So we have dip slip, we have strike slip. If you're confused on that, come see me and we'll um, try to clarify your confusion. So let's talk now about the different types of crustal faults that are out there. Now, let me clarify what I mean. When I say a crustal fault, this is a fault that's located in the crust of the earth. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about other features uh, that are in the earth. Um, things like you know how the earth is made, what it, uh, what is comprised of, those things, the magma, the thickness of the crust. But we're talking just about the crust itself. So the, these faults go through the crust. The first type of fault is called a strike-slip fault. So again, this is a fault where slip is occurring along the strike. We typically associate this with what we call transform regime. So these are places where the ground is just slipping sideways past one another. There are two types of faults. There's the right lateral and the left lateral. And the way to remember these is what we call the right hand rule. So if I'm looking down and I have uh, a gentleman standing right here and he extends his right hand out to shake mine, and I'm standing right here, and I extend my right hand out, and so we hold each other by the hands, and we shake hands. I'm looking down on the top. Now, if an earthquake happens right at the moment that we're shaking hands, and if he goes to my right, and I go to his right, we're going to call that a right lateral slip. Okay. Now, if while we're shaking hands with the right hands, he goes to my left and I go to his left, then we're going to call that a left lateral slip. So we have right lateral and left lateral strike slip faults. Just for your information, the San Andreas fault 
in California is a strike slip fault and it is a right lateral strike slip fault. Now typically the dip angle, um, so again that's this angle right here, the dip angle is very, very vertical, very steep. It's uh, almost straight up and down, 80 to 90 degrees typically. Now, um, we usually see strike slip faults in places where we see reverse faults. We'll talk about reverse faults in a minute. But like I said, San Andreas is an example. Another fault in Turkey, a famous strike slip fault, is the North Anatolian Fault. This was the fault that caused... Uh, the earthquake, I believe, in 1999, but I could be wrong. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about this beach ball looking thing. Okay, these beach ball looking things are what we call moment tensors. And they describe the movement or the slip and the dip of a faulting uh, earthquake event. And the way to think of it, uh, you can just memorize the shapes or the patterns if you want, but um, there's an easier way. Let me see if I can teach this to you. So I want you to imagine a strike slip fault and I'm looking right down on it. So with a strike slip fault, this side might go this way, this side might go this way. Take a minute and think about it and tell me what type of strike slip fault this is. Is this a right lateral strike slip fault? or a left lateral strike slip fault. Go. Okay, I'm back. Hopefully you, you took a moment and you thought about it and hopefully you said right lateral. If you did, you're right. Now, I want to just circle a section right on the soil and I'm going to pull this guy out. So I'm going to zoom this guy up right here. That line right there represents the strike. Now imagine if we get this side moving relative to this side and moving to the right. This soil on the left right here, that soil is going to want to move this way and it's going to compress this soil on the right. If this soil is in compression, we want to color it black. So in moment tensors, anything that's in compression, we're going to color it black. And anything that's in tension, we're going to leave white. So compression, tension. Okay. So down here on this side, where the soil is moving to the left, this soil right here is going to be in compression. Compression, tension. That's a moment tensor, folks. So we can get from it the orientation of the strike, and we can also get whether it's right lateral or left lateral. If we see that the compression is on the right, then it's right lateral, uh, the compression being the dark. If we see that it was flipped and the compression or the dark was over here and right there happened to be white, then it would be a left lateral strike slip fall. Okay, so again, there's the strike, zones of compression. In this case, for this moment tensor, do we have a right lateral or a left lateral strike slip fall? What do you think? If you said left lateral strike slip fall, you are correct. Okay, the next type of fault is what we call a normal fault. A normal fault is what is associated with tensile regimes. So uh, this is where, if you look at the little sketch to the right, the, the upper block of soil is trying to move away from the lower block. And the lower block is moving away from the upper block. So um, because they're moving away from each other, the ground's trying to stretch out, but the ground can't stretch because it's brittle, so it extends itself along these faulting planes. So uh, normal faults occur in zones of extension. Because it's zones of extension, they tend to be the least common of all of the faults. I find that ironic. We call it a normal fault when it's not very normal at all. Now the dip angle 
on these faults is um, pretty steep. They tend to range from 50 to 75 degrees on average. And we typically associate these types of faults with grobbins and valleys. So going back to my whiteboard again, and I'm going to do a cross section across the Salt Lake Valley. So this is the Wasatch. These are the Ochre Mountains. Right in the middle is the Salt Lake Valley. Now, if I'm looking at this as a true cross section, what we see is that this fault's going to come all the way down. This fault's going to come all the way down. One of them's eventually going to intersect. We believe uh, this guy right here is what we call the uh, Ochre Fault. And of course, this big one is the Wasatch Fault. So if the ground moves away from itself, what's going to happen to this block right here as these faults slide relative to one another? That's right. This block of soil is going to start moving down, 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 down. And that downward moving block of earth is what we call a grobin. So the valley in which we live in Utah County or in Salt Lake um, County, that's a grobin. So a great example of a normal fault, the Wasatch Fault. Now, the moment tensor for a normal fault is a little trickier. Let's go back to our whiteboard and see if we can help you understand why. So now, I'm looking straight down on my normal fault. So um, let me see. That's the plan view. Inside view, it might look something like this. So I'm looking at a circle right there. There's my circle looking straight down. So if I look straight down on that circle, I'm going to pull this circle out. That line, right, that's the strike. Now, if this portion or this lower slab is moving this way and the upper slab is moving that way, so they're moving away from each other, where's my compression going to be? My compression is going to be on the outside of my circle. Out here. So when we see a moment tensor for a normal fall, it's going to look like an eyeball, but the dark or the compression is going to be on the outside of the eyeball. And on the inside, it's going to be white. Now, we just remove the line there for the stripe because, one, we don't really need it. We can just imagine it that it's there. And, two, it just looks creepy. It looks like some snake eye or something. So uh, that's how we read a moment tensor for a normal fault. So, again, the dark, that's compression. And the light is tension. Okay, let's talk about the next type of crustal fault. This is a reverse or a thrust fault, typically associated with compressional regimes. Think of a normal fault, but this time the blocks are moving towards each other, not away. So the fault is getting crushed, basically, and eventually it's going to break, and one block is going to slide upwards relative to the next. This is a very common type of crustal fault, and they're often associated with strike-slip faults. The dip angle for these type of faults um, can be very, very shallow, 10 or degrees or so, or it can go up to about 55 degrees. So when you have a reverse fault that has a really low dip angle, usually less than 40 or 35 degrees or so, 
then we call those thrust faults because they, they think of it as the ground gets thrust up. And these types of faults generally are the most powerful of all the crustal faults. And, and if you think about it, um, it makes sense because in this particular case, when you have a reverse fault, the rock is in compression. And so when you have rock or concrete that's in compression and it breaks, it tends to explode with a huge amount of energy. Um, if you take concrete or rock and you put it in tension, it doesn't explode, it kind of breaks along a crack. So when it breaks, you do get a release of energy, but it's not that big explosion of energy that you got with um, the compression failure. So some examples of some crustal faults include the Seattle Fault, a very dangerous fault that runs right through downtown Seattle, and the Himalayan Frontal Thrust Fault. So if we look at the uh, moment tensors for a crustal fault or for a reverse fault, now let's imagine that this time, same diagram, but now the ground is moving this way. The two blocks of soil are moving close together. So it's going to look the same in terms of our moment tensor. We have a circle. The line is going to be going through it. But instead of moving away from each other, now we're moving towards one another. So there's my strike. So now if we're moving towards one another, um, I'm going to be building up compression right in the middle. And I'm going to be having tension on the outside of my circle. So that then means that I have a reverse or a thrust fault when I see that eyeball shape and it's dark in the center. Okay, an oblique fault is an interesting crustal fault. It's a combination of a strike slip and either a normal or a reverse fault. And so you uh, get this beach ball looking shape that's kind of like a... Um, a marriage between the, uh, for this particular case, it would be a marriage between a normal fault and a strike slip fault. Most of the faults that we see in the real world have some level of obliquity. There's not just pure strike slip or pure dip slip. There's usually some combination of both strike and dip slip. All right. Let's talk about another seismic source. This is a subduction zone. There's some a very important distinguishing characteristic that we need to make right now. That is that when we talk about crustal faults, generally, uh, with the exception of maybe a transform fault where you might have a strike slip, generally crustal faults do not make plate boundaries for the most part. Crustal faults don't always equal plate boundaries. Whoa, how did I do that? Okay. So but subduction zones are plate boundaries. And they're a boundary where one plate uh, is diving or being pushed beneath another plate. Plates are huge, folks. They're huge. And so they have a massive amount of mass, weight, and power behind them. So when we talk about subduction zone sources, we're talking about a potentially enormous source of seismic energy. Um, so there are two types of subduction zone sources. There are what we have uh, interplate and intraplate events. So when I have um, interplate events, interplate Inter means between, so that would be if the earthquake happens somewhere between the two plates. 
and you get some big slip and sliding between the two plates. So these are what we tend to call um, interplate or another name for those are the mega thrust earthquakes. Okay, now if you have intraplate, intraplate means that uh, as this lithosphere, the oceanic crust gets pushed down beneath the continental crust, you're going to start to develop cracking as it bends. Every time it cracks, you're going to release energy. That is an intraplate subduction zone event. Intraplate events can be dangerous because they can occur um, very deep in the earth and directly beneath your city and send energy basically straight up right beneath your feet. Um, interplate events are usually what's associated with tsunamis, which we'll talk about uh, next week. And intraplate, like I said, they're usually very deep. They have smaller magnitudes, usually uh, certainly less than seven and a half, I would say, but they can be very damaging. Interplate, intraplate events. One thing I want to point out, the Benioff zone is this deep portion of the oceanic crust that's getting subducted. That's where the intraplate events tend to occur. So an example of a subduction zone source would be the Cascadia subduction zone. What does the, uh, the moment tensor look like? Well, it's very big, so we're dealing with um, a huge zone of compression. So half of the beach ball is completely colored in, half of it is completely open, meaning tension. Um, so, the, so you look at uh, this shape or this symbol, we're talking about subduction zone sources. Okay, let's get into the size of earthquakes and how we characterize and distinguish between the size. There's two principal ways that seismologists, geologists, and engineers describe the size of an earthquake. The first is called earthquake intensity. And the second is earthquake magnitude. Now you may look at those two descriptions and say, well, they're the same thing, aren't they? Um, no, they're not. And we're going to talk about why they're different. Earthquake intensity is the strength of the shaking that you feel. It's how hard the ground is shaking it, and it can vary depending on where you are. Um, so before seismograms or instruments were physically invented to record earthquakes, we had to rely on subjective descriptors uh, or surveys from people to try to quantify um, the strength of shaking in different areas. And so we call this descriptor the intensity of the shaking. And it's usually based on a scale of, of 1 to 10 or 1 to 12, depending on the different scales that you're using. And there's whole bunches of scales. Um, you can you know, pause the video and copy these down in your notes. But for instance, the, the rossi Forel scale is what's most commonly used in Italy. The modified Mercalli scale, as I've closed it, or, or I'm sorry, as I circled it here, this is what's most common used in the United States well, through most of the world today uh, with the exception of Europe and um, Japan. The Medvede Spoenhauer Karnik method is a method that's used more in Eastern Europe um, and then of course the JMA Japanese Meteorological Agency intensity scale is, is what's used in Japan. These scales on, that are on these surveys that they used to send out to people have different descriptors and people would uh, think about their experience in the earthquake and then look at these different descriptors and select which descriptor best described the experience they had in the earthquake. So um, take a moment and read through some of these descriptors, right? So if you look, for instance, at a descriptor of a five, 
It was felt by nearly everyone. Many people were awakened. Some dishes, windows, etc. were broken. There were some maybe cracked plaster. Some unstable objects were overturned. Their trees might have been disturbed. So you kind of see um, these different descriptors that describe the amount of shaking or energy that occurred. And then so people would fill in these surveys and they'd mail them back. And then folks would go and they would start to map the surveys and, and start to draw contour lines. One of the advantages or nice things about these types of surveys is that we can go back to even really old earthquakes like this uh, New Madrid earthquakes from 1811 and 1812. And just based off descriptions that were published in newspapers like in, um, oops, sorry, like in New York or Boston or Detroit, um, we can get an estimate or guess what the intensity was in those cities and try to draw these contour maps of intensity. We call those maps isoseismal maps. So isoseismal maps are contour maps of earthquake intensity. One last thing I want to say about intensity Oops. is that um, Let's say I have an earthquake that happens here, and I have maybe some guy standing over here, and he's standing on um, very, very soft, jiggly soil. And let's say over here, the exact same distance, I have another guy and he's standing on very, very hard, stiff rock or soil. These two guys are going to feel different levels of shaking from the same event, even though they're the same distance away, because the ground motions are going to be amplified or de-amplified differently as they move up through the soil beneath them. So the ground motions that they feel, that's the earthquake intensity. Now, when we talk about magnitude, magnitude is an absolute value, and it's a way to describe uh, a, an absolute measure of the energy that was released by an earthquake. So with the introduction of equipment to record and measure these earthquake ground motions, we didn't need to rely anymore on subjective measurement scales, but we could actually measure the amount of energy. And so based on the amount of energy that were, was developed, we started developing different magnitude scales to describe the earthquake. Now, it seems weird because we're still relying on the amount of shaking that's occurring, uh, which could be subjective to characterize the earthquake and that lead but it was the best that we could do at the time and so that's led to a couple of these different magnitude scales uh, which we'll talk about briefly here the Richter local magnitude scale was the first one that was developed and that's why you often hear um, news people and talk about the Richter scale what they're really referring to is this Richter local magnitude uh, it's a scale uh, from one to, uh, 1 to 10, and it's based off the measurements of a very specific seismic instrument called the Wood Anderson Seismometer. When we go up to the University of Utah in April, they have one of these things on display out in front of their seismic station lab, and it's pretty cool to see. So um, the Wood Anderson seismometer would uh, move, it has a, a, a constant mass, and then based on how much the Anderson seismometer moved, it would tell you what the magnitude was of the earthquake. But there were some problems with this. Uh, so the first one is that it was really only calibrated for Southern California earthquakes, and it doesn't distinguish between the different wave types that we've talked about. Also, the uh, scale is very sensitive to periods up to 0 0.8 seconds. Why is that? Well, because this is the resonant frequency of the instrument itself. And finally, 
the this magnitude scale tends to saturate at magnitudes between 6.5 to 7. Well, what do I mean by saturate? That's crazy. What I mean is, oops, I keep pressing that. I'm sorry. What I mean is, if I were to plot, for instance, um, energy released by earthquake on this axis, and the magnitude that we were measuring, we would expect to see that with increasing energy, that the magnitude would keep going up and up and up and up. But what we tend to see in reality with this magnitude scale is that it tends to do this. And that even with increasing energy, it's still going to give us the same magnitude. Well, why in the world would it do that? Well, it would do that if we're basing this off a seismometer with a mass and the seismometer goes all the way and starts banging against the edge of the box. Once it hits the edge of the box, it can't indicate any more energy. And so that's one of the reasons why these early instruments started saturating. The surface wave magnitude is based off of surface seismic waves. It uses the label M sub S, S for surface wave, and it's based on the amplitude of Rayleigh waves with a period of about 20 seconds. Now, this wave magnitude is based on displacements, not accelerations. And we're going to calculate it using this equation right here, where A is the maximum displacement that we measure with our instrument. And this delta term is an epicentral distance but it's not a distance like you think it's it's actually an angle so when we say epicentral distance we're really referring to an angle and it's the angle that the earthquake makes if you go down follow the earthquake to the center of the earth and come back up to your source that angle that it makes there we call that the epicentral distance so some of the problems associated with the surface wave magnitude was that it wasn't giving really good numbers for deep earthquakes or really, really close earthquakes. So in other words, if you look at this little sketch here, if your site is located right there next to the earthquake, you're going to get a very, very small epicentral distance and uh, then it's going to mess up your equation. And uh, similar to the Richter magnitude, we see saturation at magnitudes between 8 and 8.5. And so the largest magnitude we can measure with the surface wave magnitude only is an 8.5. So they developed the body wave magnitude to try to, to deal with some of these issues. And it uh, uses the little B as a subscript for that. And now this one is based not on surface waves, but it's based on body waves and more specifically P waves. So body wave magnitude was better suited for deep focus earthquakes. And we can calculate it with this equation right here. The only thing different from the previous uh, equation that we saw is that we have the amplitude of the first few cycles of the P wave. And then we have the period of the first few cycles of the P wave. But the problems associated with this were the opposite of the surface wave magnitude. This was not well suited for large or shallow earthquakes. And it tends to saturate out at a magnitude of 6.5. So that leads us now to the moment magnitude. We use a little subscript W to characterize moment magnitude. Moment magnitude isn't something that we necessarily measure with any instrument. Um, seismologists said we got to move away from these instruments because instruments are based on um, local intensities and they're, they're not giving us constant values. We need to be more consistent. And so they moved to the moment magnitude scale where everything was based off a calculated seismic moment. And so we calculate the amount of energy associated with the earthquake, and then we associate that with a magnitude. So it's not based on any single instrument, and it's become the most commonly used magnitude scale today.
So if I'm looking now at moment magnitude, um, I'm going to erase all this stuff here. If I'm looking at moment magnitude with increasing energy, guess what? I get increasing magnitude and it goes all the way up. So it doesn't saturate. We compute moment magnitude with this equation here where m naught is the seismic moment that we discussed earlier in our lecture. This magnitude, even though it's used by engineers and geologists and seismologists today, it's almost always confused with the Richter magnitude. So when you hear um, reporters on TV, they say it was an 8.5 on the Richter scale. No, no one uses Richter anymore. Really, it was a magnitude 8.5 on the moment magnitude scale. So the nice thing about moment magnitude is that it gives us an indication of the amount of energy that was released from the earthquake. So let's look at an example here. Um, here we have the equation for our um, seismic moment. Back calculate, all we did was we took the equation for the moment magnitude and we flipped it around to solve for um, m naught or for our seismic moment. So now if we do this, we can look at energies from different magnitude events. So let's do a little experiment where we're going to compute the energy or the moment associated with a magnitude 6.0 and a magnitude 8.0 event. So I want you to take some time do this yourself first and see if you get the same numbers I do. Take this equation that I just circled and I want you to calculate in ergs the, uh, the log of the seismic moment or uh, go ahead and factor it up to pull out just the seismic moment itself and see what you get for the two different magnitudes. Go ahead and pause and go. Okay, so you should be back now. Hopefully you calculated those seismic moments. Let's do it first for a magnitude 6.0. So the energy is going to be equal to this equation right here. That's the seismic moment, which we compute to be 1.12 times 10 to the 25th ergs. Now it's computed for a magnitude 8.0 event. Same equation, the only thing that's different between these two are the magnitudes we're plugging in, and we get 1.12 times 10 to the 28th ergs. So what we uh, can see is if we take the ratio of those two, we get a thousand times difference. So there's a thousand times more energy released in a magnitude 8.0 earthquake than in a magnitude 6.0 earthquake. So if we're going to do a direct comparison then between intensity and magnitude, Summarizing intensity, it's subjective measure of size. It depends on where you're standing and it depends the soils beneath you. It depends how far away from the source you are. It depends on how strong of shaking you feel. So it varies based on location and what's beneath you. It requires a survey of people, but it can produce ISO seismal maps. I do want to say though that we have correlations now that correlate um, intensity to different measured ground motions from instruments. So, uh, but it is strongly influenced by local site conditions. Looking at magnitude, magnitude is instead an objective measure of size. It's constant for no matter where you're located relative to the earthquake. It's calculated from instru instruments or um, from the seismic moment, which isn't an actual instrument but it's something that we calculate. There's no map associated with it. It's just a single value and it's independent of any local site conditions. So let's finish up with one last thing we want to talk about. Um, how do we estimate magnitudes then for different types of faults, defaults of different sizes? Uh, what happened was uh, different seismologists, particularly Wells and Coppersmith, got together and they went ahead and collected data from different earthquakes. Um, so they went to different faults where earthquakes had occurred and they started recording, okay, what was the magnitude of that earthquake? 
what's the geometry parameters with this fault how long is it what's the dip what's the, how you know and they started recording all that information to try to look for correlations that uh, between the geometry the size of the fault and the magnitude of earthquake that it produced and so they developed these different linear regressions and they came up with a relationship or an equation that looks like this where we have different parameters um, y is the dependent variable this is what you're trying to calculate whether it's magnitude or whether you're starting with magnitude and you're back calculating um, say the length of the fault you have regression coefficients these are just what the statistical number crunchers spit out to say you know these are the numbers that fit your data we have the independent variable so this is the input that we're providing to the equations then we have the scatter in the data so uh, we can characterize this with a student's t distribution from probability theory we have alpha which is the probability of not exceeding um, a certain uh, standard deviation we have the standard deviation associated with the data and then we have n which is the number of events or number of data points in the model so look I get it you know everybody's cool everybody um, is comfortable with this portion of the equation the linear portion when you start adding the probability stuff in there it gets a little confusing uh, because you're not used to it this homework assignment is going to stretch you a little bit because you're going to be forced to start using some of this stuff but I've given you some help I've given you um, an example if you go on the learning suite I want you to download a handout that uh, Dr. Travis Gerber who's now with Gerhardt Cole um, prepared that I really really liked and so with his permission I've, I've um, liked to use it with my classes and it talks a little bit about the statistics and, and how to use that students T distribution um, so take some time go look at that and look through the example and see how they used uh, those relationships to compute magnitude for different faults one thing I want to point out is that these Wells and Coppersmith equations you know they're from 1994 we they didn't have a lot of data to deal with particularly with certain types of faults like normal faults they had a ton of strike slip faults they had a good number of reverse faults but they didn't have a lot of normal faulting events so they were regressing and developing relationships based off a relatively small amount of data when you have a little amount of data but you're developing prediction models from it it can be pretty dangerous so if we have a relationship from the Wells and Coppersmith paper that has um, you know less than 25 data points associated with it most people won't use it because 25 data points to make a prediction model isn't a whole lot so instead um, of specifying a specific type of fault we'll usually use the model associated with all faults so that's where Wells and Coppersmith just combine all faults together and um, use those values instead so Generally, this isn't a problem unless we're dealing with normal faults, which when we live in Utah, guess what? That's what we're dealing with. So a couple of problems with these Wells and Coppersmith equations. Um, the, the equations are based off faults and earthquakes in the western United States. Um, they weren't developed for fault or earthquake sources in stable continental regions like the central or eastern part of the United States they have no subduction zone data in them whatsoever they're only based off crustal faults so strike slip normal reverse and oblique faults <clears throat> and then of course we see a lot of people out in practice that are inappropriately using these Wells and Coppersmith equations they use the wrong models they use them incorrectly uh, and that's because they didn't read the paper they didn't learn how to properly use the models and so they start producing garbage uh, for their predictions and it can get them in some trouble 
Another problem with this relationship is the data is just old. This paper was published in 1994. That's more than 20 years ago. There have been a lot of new data collected since then. And because there's been new data collected, um, a group of seismologists called Sterling and others in 2013 published their great paper in the Bulletin of Seismological Engineering, uh, or I'm sorry, the, the Bulletin of, uh, of Seismology of America or something like that. I think that was the journal. And they um, described and summarized a lot of these um, magnitude prediction equations for different types of faults and scenarios. They organized it according to um, the plate tectonic setting. So you see we have boundary, crustal, we have stable continental subduction zones, and volcanoes. And then given what your plate boundary is, you then move to the next, which is uh, a, what they call a subclass. So uh, for instance, you have a plate boundary or a crustal fault. Do you have a fast one that's moving at more than 10 millimeters per year? Or do you have a slow one that's moving uh, less than 10 millimeters per year? Um, and so then based on what you choose a subclass, you select what fault type you have. Do you have strike slip? Do you have all faults? Do you have normal, reverse? And uh, you see at the end of the, all of these characterizations, you get a number, like a number like A22 or A11. A is uh, meaning it's a plate boundary crustal or reverse, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry B1 or C3, all of these different classifications from the Sterling paper. Then you go in their paper to um, their tables and you look for models that apply to A22 or A11 or C3, whatever your classification is, you pick a model that fits your classification. So I've provided the Sterling and others model for you guys on Learning Suite to also read. You are going to need to at least um, skim through the Sterling and others model and the Wells and Coppersmith 94 model. I'd prefer that you read it so you know what you're doing um, and that will help prevent you from making mistakes or using these models incorrectly. Again, these models are going to push you, they're going to challenge you because it's, it's stuff you're not used to and it's new to you and it deals with probability. But digest it, concentrate on it, read it again and again and eventually you'll digest it and understand it. So that's the end of this lecture. I appreciate your time. I know it's a long lecture, but hopefully you're able to get through it um, in pieces and increments. And I will see you next time, class. Have a great day.